flight in three years. Still, CNN's John Zarella reports NASA is fairly tight-lipped about this space mission. The birds will tell you the weather couldn't be much better. Blue skies and a light wind. If the countdown continues along smoothly, the shuttle Columbia and its five-man crew will lift off from the Kennedy Space Center Tuesday morning. It will mark the 30th space shuttle flight and the fourth to carry a secret military cargo. Because it is a secret mission, only NASA and the Department of Defense know when the mission clock will start. The public won't know the exact time of launch until the countdown clock lights up at T-minus nine minutes. And we've got a launch period tomorrow from 7.30 a.m. to 11.30 a.m. Eastern Time. It has been speculated that there are two payloads inside the vehicle's cargo bay. One, a sophisticated spy satellite called La Crosse, designed to guide B-2 stealth bombers to targets inside the Soviet Union. The other, smaller payload, is thought to be a package of Star Wars experiments. We have uh, received our announcement uh, from launch director Gene Thomas that we have scrubbed our attempt for today. Columbia's last flight into space was delayed half a dozen times for weather and technical problems. It finally got off the ground two weeks before the Challenger accident. After that, Columbia, the oldest of the orbiters, sat virtually in mothballs for a year and a half. Since then, it has undergone more than 250 modifications. We've thoroughly inspected all the components. We've done the structural inspections. We've replaced components or given them a tune-up or refurbished them. But some NASA engineers say privately that Columbia, now more than a decade old, should be retired. It has been gutted so many times for spare parts, they say it is just not the same vehicle it once was. The woman responsible for getting Columbia ready says it's in great shape. So there's nothing wrong with the orbiter, it's just we needed the time and, and the people to devote to it to get it ready. If all goes well on this mission, NASA will have the three orbiters it needs to carry out an ambitious schedule in the coming months. The nature of this mission is so sensitive that even its duration is being kept secret. NASA won't announce the exact time of landing until 24 hours before the vehicle touches down. John Zarella, CNN, at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. Early bird news at 5.30 a.m. Eastern. And has bought a fleet of unmanned rockets. The Pentagon reportedly feels manned flights are too risky, especially in light of the Challenger disaster. Later on Newsnight, we will talk with a military uh, space expert on these new developments. Center with an update on today's plans. Good morning, John. Good morning, Bob. And yes, uh, it is a secret. We don't know when the launch will occur. Sometime this morning between 7.30 a.m. and 11.30 a.m. Try and put a better timeline on it. The astronauts are at the launch pad. They are probably in the vehicle right now. They arrived there, oh, just about uh, 30 minutes ago or so. That would mean that considering the time that they are usually in the vehicle before launch, that the speculation of a launch around 7.57 this morning is probably pretty accurate. One of the concerns early in that launch window is for fog here at the Kennedy Space Center. Still dark here right now. It looks like it's going to be a beautiful morning, uh, but there is a concern of some fog early in the launch window, and they are taking a look at one of the landing sites, the transatlantic abort sites, where there may be a weather problem. Other than that, absolutely no problems with the vehicle. We don't know about the, uh, the cargo it's carrying. Again, as you said, believed to be a spy satellite and also a Star Wars experiment. Now, this is the first flight of the shuttle Columbia in three and a half years, and only the second time, the third time, that the shuttle is, this shuttle has flown in about six years. NASA has spent the last two years or so refurbishing, modifying Columbia. Uh, matter of fact, I have a model here of a shuttle, and I can give you an idea of what they've been doing. Basically, all of this black area here is shuttle tile, and what NASA has done is literally, literally replace more than 2,000 tiles on this vehicle. It's a painstaking process. It requires hours and hours of work and thousands of hours of man hour. Of course, the engines have all been replaced. The orbital maneuvering systems have been replaced. 250 upgrades in all to this vehicle, which is more than a decade old, and it's the oldest orbiter. But NASA says it is confident that Columbia is ready to go. The five-man crew, all military men, two of them veterans of space shuttle flights in the past, past, are at the launch pad. All things here this morning appear to be go. We'll just have to sit here and wait with you folks in Atlanta until there is a launch. Again, nine minutes before launch, we will finally begin to see the countdown clock ticking. 
and that will be the only indication we have that everything is going, that we're proceeding for a morning launch. Bob? John, with all this Pentagon secrecy, the question has to occur to some of us whether, given what we know about Soviet intelligence capabilities and the presence of one of their trawlers offshore, at least, aren't the odds that they probably know more already about this mission than you and I will for some time? Quite a bit, and if you read some of the news magazines and science magazines in this country, they'll give you the complete details of what this vehicle is supposedly carrying. Not only that, uh, there is a Soviet journalist here Oddly enough, a Department of Defense launch, and there's a Soviet journalist who works uh, on an exchange program with an Atlanta TV station who is here, the first Soviet journalist to witness a space shuttle flight, and it just happens to be a Department of Defense secret classified mission. So perhaps it is much ado about nothing. Bob? All right. Thank you. Correspondent John Zarella updating us live. Here to go. Because the mission is classified, many details have been kept secret, including the exact time for blast off. The window for blastoff is between 7.30 and 11.30 a.m. Eastern Time. ABC News will carry the launch live. From the Kennedy Space Center in Florida, Jim Slade reports on this veteran shuttle's return to space. Columbia has been laid up for repairs and modification ever since the Challenger disaster three and a half years ago. We've gone for main engine start. We the original of the shuttle fleet, Columbia flew eight times before being taken out of service for changes made necessary by the investigations that followed the accident. It's older and about 7,000 pounds heavier than the other shuttles because of test equipment and other plumbing installed for its pioneering flights which began in April of 1981. Because of that, it can carry less payload to orbit, a factor in its being last for upgrading. But now it's back, and its crewmen say they're anxious to get underway. Do you have confidence in Columbia, considering it, it's been stuck in a hangar for three and a half years? Absolutely. You bet I do. If I didn't, we wouldn't climb in it. Columbia is expected to carry a military package to orbit over the Soviet Union. Sources indicate it's a 10-ton strategic reconnaissance satellite capable of delivering detailed photographs of the surface. A smaller package mounted in the cargo bay is thought to be associated with the Star Wars program. Unless there's something wrong, there'll be no chatter from the astronauts during this flight. Since it's a flight totally dedicated to the military, the radio circuits have been closed to the public. Jim Slade, ABC News, the Kennedy Space Center. In Ethiopia, a mass... I'm here to show you some of the areas uh, of heat tiles that they have uh, replaced. They have uh, reinforced the area up in here and taken all the heat tiles underneath the shuttle and have uh, replaced all of them with a lighter weight version uh, that uh, replaced the bulky tiles that uh, the uh, Columbia had on it when it first went up. CNN's John Zarella is at the Kennedy Space Center and joins us live this morning. Uh, John, it's uh, a big secret what's inside, but most people have a pretty good idea what the spy satellite's all about. Well, that seems to be the case, Tom. Just before we get to that, weather looks great here. Uh, there is fog. You can hardly see the space shuttle behind us. And uh, in the early part of that launch window, which begins in roughly 25 minutes, uh, they say the fog might be a problem till about 8.30, but whether it's a, a problem enough to stop the launch that we all think will happen at 7.57 is, uh, is another story. The, uh, the shuttle is apparently in great shape, the orbiter in, uh, in terrific shape. The astronauts got on board about 5 a.m. this morning, so the countdown from all we can ascertain in this news blackout is proceeding smoothly. The only thing we don't really know about is, of course, as you said, the spy satellite and the other package that's on board. With me is uh, John Pike, the uh, Federation of American Scientists and uh, an expert on these sorts of matters. And, uh, John, there's been a lot of speculation about what Columbia is carrying. What uh, have you been able to ascertain? Well, uh, this has been probably one of the most difficult calls we've made on the identity of the payload. Uh, prior to yesterday, it looked like it could either be a lacrosse imaging radar satellite uh, or the first of a new generation of photographic reconnaissance satellites that's popularly called a KH-12. Uh, with some additional information that uh, we managed to uncover last night, particularly considering the schedule of the unmanned Titan rockets, which we're supposed to be putting up the KH-12, I think that we're all now fairly convinced that this will be the first of uh, these KH-12 photo reconnaissance birds. For the viewers out there and for those of us who aren't uh, in tune with all of these satellites, what is a KH-12 bird? What can it do? Well, the KH-12 is uh, going to be the most advanced, most sophisticated photographic reconnaissance satellite that the United States ever has ever put into orbit. It's basically a very sophisticated television camera hooked up to a large telescope 
that rather than looking up towards the stars, is looking down towards the Earth. We'd use it for treaty verification, collection of intelligence about Soviet military developments, monitoring crises in the third world. This satellite uh, would be able to detect objects as small as a few inches across. Couldn't read a license plate, but it could certainly see a license plate, which is fairly amazing considering that it'll be orbiting at an altitude of a few hundred miles. That, uh, though, is, that though, is a low altitude for as satellites go. Right, this is a uh, very low uh, orbit. In fact, it's so low that the KH-12 is going to have to use its onboard engine uh, every several months to uh, move it back up to a higher orbit or it would uh, come back due to atmospheric drag. One last very quick question. The other payload that we all hear about, a Star Wars payload, any idea what that's all about? Well, apparently it's a uh, weighs a couple of hundred pounds in contrast to the 28,000 pounds of the primary payload. And this satellite uh, is a, uh, looks like it's going to be some sort of sensor test to get information on what uh, the space background looks like to help Star Wars weapons and sensor development. John Pike, thank you very much for being with us this morning. Well, there you have it, Tom. Uh, that's what we know here about what's in the vehicle, and we all expect the launch uh, in less than an hour. Tom? All right, there is one item that while we don't know what's in the payload, we definitely know who's aboard. They have been on board the shuttle for about two hours now. They were taken by van and a security car out uh, to the pad about 5 a.m. Uh, the commander of this flight is Brewster Shaw. He's 44-year-old Air Force Colonel. He's been in the astronaut corps since 1978. He has gone aloft twice as the pilot of Columbia back in 1983 and the commander of Atlantis in 1985. Richard Richards is the shuttle pilot, a 42-year-old commander with the U.S. Navy. He has no previous uh, on-flight experience. He's been an astronaut since 1981. Mark Brown is a mission specialist, 37-year-old Air Force major. He has been an astronaut since 1985, and again, another space rookie. James Adamson is a uh, mission specialist. He's a 43-year-old Army colonel, and uh, lieutenant colonel, rather. He has no previous missions, another rookie. He's been in the astronaut corps since 1985. The other veteran on board, David Leithma, he is the mission specialist, a 40-year-old commander in the U.S. Navy. He was in Challenger on 1984. He's been in the astronaut corps since 1981. In less than an hour, of course, uh, Columbia will be uh, sent aloft, we hope, and we, of course, will have live coverage here on CNN. Molly. Now at 1130 a.m. Eastern Time. When it goes, ABC News will bring you live coverage. The Columbia, back in operation after being laid up for repair work for the past three and a half years, is carrying a secret military payload. Sources indicate it's a spy satellite. And Tom and Tier is here now with some details on the status of this military mission. Tom? Well, Brian, the countdown is a secret. The clock hasn't started moving yet, and we uh, got word just a few moments ago that they only have four-mile visibility. It takes five before they can launch the space shuttle, so they are in a hold. Uh, we assume that they are at the nine-minute mark on the clock and holding, uh, but they have still have zeros down on the clock and won't start it until uh, they're ready to not stop it uh, because of any constraints like the weather. CNN's John Zarella is uh, live at the Kennedy Space Center and uh, taking a look at the uh, fog situation. Uh, fog, not an uncommon uh, uh, weather effect uh, at the Cape, uh, especially this time of year, John. That's right, Tom. It certainly is not, and uh, it's already miserably hot here. Uh, the fog, we knew as of yesterday that there would be a problem early in this launch window uh, after 7.30 that the fog might be a problem. And if you take a look just over my shoulder here, you can see that the, the vehicle itself is completely shrouded from this distance, four miles away from the launch pad. You can barely see it. The other problem with the fog is if there were an emergency and the vehicle had to return to the shuttle landing strip uh, just a couple of miles from here, they need that visibility in order, to, uh, in order to get back to the shuttle landing site. So the problem there is that uh, twofold. One, at launch, as you said, minimum of five miles visibility, and also the fact that they need the visibility to get back to the shuttle landing site in case there, there were an emergency. Now, although the fog is shrouding the vehicle, the, uh, the shroud over the secret payload that the shuttle is apparently uh, carrying has lifted to some degree. With me is John Pike, Federation of American Scientists. And, uh, and John, uh, after some difficult analysis, what have your folks come up with on this secret military mission and what the uh, vehicle's carrying? Well, figuring out this payload has proved to be a greater challenge than on previous uh, secret unmanned and shuttle flights. But after looking at uh, all the facts that uh, we were able to dig up, it looks like this payload is going to be the first of a new generation 
of photographic reconnaissance satellites. A satellite has popularly been referred to as the KH-12. Satellite will be used for treaty verification, for monitoring military crises in the third world. And even though it isn't going to be able to read license plates, uh, it will be able to see them, detecting objects as small as a few inches across. So this is a, a very important payload then that the, the vehicle is carrying. Well, actually, this satellite is the satellite that the shuttle was designed to carry into orbit. Uh, the original military requirements for the shuttle laid down back in the early 1970s dictated the design of the shuttle in order to make it easier for the shuttle to carry this specific payload. Now. There is also another payload on board there, a, a, a Star Wars experiment of some sort? Well, it looks like in addition to carrying this very large 28,000 pound payload, that they're also going to carry a very small satellite weighing only a few hundred pounds. The satellite's going to collect sensor data for Star Wars uh, experiments that would be conducted later in the 1990s. John Pike, thank you very much. What we think, uh, Tom Mintier, back in Atlanta, is that uh, the launch may come around 8.30. That's when NASA says the, uh, the fog will lift enough that uh, they can get Columbia off the ground on its first flight in three and a half years. Tom? All right, John, as we should point out, it's unlike uh, previous uh, launches where they had a very narrow window, they have uh, uh, four hours uh, to get the job done this morning, and if the fog doesn't burn off by 11.30 in the morning at the Kennedy Space Center, uh, it would be a very unusual event. The astronauts uh, made it out to the pad about 5 a.m. this morning, but not before the traditional breakfast. They don't really have breakfast here. They just uh, sit in front of a cake that is frozen until they return. Uh, seated left from right is... Uh, com uh, Navy Commander David Liesma, uh, this is, uh, he pioneered the technique for refueling satellites in space. And beside him is the uh, pilot, uh, Captain uh, Dick Richards. And then beside him is the uh, commander of this mission, uh, Brewster Shaw. This will be his uh, third flight uh, aboard a space shuttle. And we have a couple of rookies uh, that are on this flight, uh, Lieutenant Colonel James Adamson and uh, Air Force Major uh, Mark Brown. This is uh, his uh, first flight aboard the space shuttle. Uh, then they took the uh, walkout, uh, which occurred very early this morning, uh, well before 5 a.m., uh, an eight-mile ride out to the pad, pad 39B, where they are waiting now. They were all smiles uh, as they uh, climbed aboard the uh, special bus that is uh, taking them out to the pad, where they are now, and they are waiting as we are waiting to see the clock light up with nine minutes and moving. Right now it is nine minutes and holding because of the weather. We, of course, will have the launch for you live here. Norma? At the Kennedy Space Center, the weather had uh, uh, slowed it up from the time we thought it would start, which was uh, uh, some time ago, but uh, it looks now like the count has begun at nine minutes, more of daybreak in just a moment. send the stored program commands, which is the final update on antenna map. Weather that was a concern a little while ago, they only had about four and a half miles visibility, but uh, let's listen in now as the uh, count is underway. This is the uh, first flight of uh, Columbia in a long time. It was originally launched uh, back on April 12th of 1981, but it has been sitting in a hangar uh, for uh, some time, and they even called it the Hangar Queen. I'll ask Dick Richards to initiate the pre-starting procedure. Mission Control has transmitted the signal to start the onboard flight recorders. These are two recorders which will collect measurements of shuttle systems performance during the flight and will be removed and played back after the mission. At T minus five minutes, the orbiter test conductor will ask pilot Dick Richards to start the auxiliary power units which provides the hydraulic power for steering. This will be, this will be the fourth uh, military, all military flight of the uh, space shuttle program. Uh, the last one was December of uh, 1988. Here you can see the uh, shuttle landing facility. If they do have a problem in the first few minutes of flight, uh, they can return to the launch clock site. Clock stands desk. now at T minus five minutes and counting. At the five minutes now, now, the clock. CNN's John Zarella joins us now from the Kennedy Space Center. Uh, John, I understand that uh, you can now see a lot better uh, and see the shuttle uh, very quickly. The uh, fog seemed to lift. Well, a little bit, Tom. From here, you still can't make it out. Uh, as well as we would like to. I don't think the launch is going to be as spectacular as most are, at least initially, uh, until it clears that uh, layer of fog uh, that, that's over it. But again, it has cleared enough that uh, the five miles minimum visibility, that they're going to go ahead and get, the, uh, get this bird off the ground. Tom? They do need the five miles uh, uh, for launch, but don't they, they need some better uh, weather 
uh, for a return to the launch site, uh, the landing strip there at the Kennedy Space Center. They certainly do. They need about seven miles visibility for that, and apparently they have that. If I look this way to where the landing site is, you can't see any fog at all over in that direction. Of course, on an RTLS abort, which uh, takes about 30 minutes, they're going to need clear visibility to get that vehicle back down on the ground safely over at that landing site. Throughout the morning, uh, shuttle astronaut Mike Coates has been uh, flying the uh, shuttle training aircraft, uh, uh, taking a look at that seven-mile uh, window that they need uh, to come back to the Kennedy Space Center should it, that become necessary. Uh, a little while ago, uh, they took their ride out to the launch pad. Actually, it was about 5 a.m. Eastern time. Uh, this uh, is uh, in the suit-up room, and uh, you can see that the suits are much bulkier than the ones they used to use. Uh, uh, pre-challenger uh, they use very lightweight flight suits and uh, they are all suited up they've been in since five o'clock this morning let's go back now out to the uh, Kennedy Space Center on the pad and uh, see Columbia once again uh, all eyes will be wondering uh, how well they have prepared this shuttle uh, they have taken the engines uh, from other orbiters now they have the uh, retiled it Minus three minutes. Now at three minutes in the two countdown, minutes, two, uh, two they spent a lot of work. Uh, they started last November to uh, refurbish the shuttle. And the gaseous nitrogen of the main engines will be terminated. Liquid oxygen pressure now coming to flight level. The ground loss sequencer has started to retract the gaseous oxygen vent hood or the beanie cap on the external tank. The computers will make a final check to ensure that the bent arm is fully retracted at the T-minus 37 second point. T-minus 2 minutes 20 seconds. Ground supplies of hydrogen and oxygen for the orbiter fuel cells have been turned off. Columbia is now running on its, in, its onboard reactants. The orbiter test conductor has asked pilot Dick Richards to clear the caution and warning memory system. He reports that that clearing is completed and he reported no expected errors. T minus two minutes. The crew has just been told to close their visors on their launch and reentry helmets and to start the oxygen supply to their pressure suits. T minus one minute, 50 seconds. The liquid hydrogen replenishing of the external tank has stopped and the tank is now being pressurized to flight level. The space shuttle is now isolated from all ground propellant and fluid loading equipment. T minus one minute, 30 seconds. We're less than a minute and a half away now from the launch of STS-28 and its crew of five astronauts. At uh, T minus one minute, the ground launch sequencer will verify that the shuttle main engines are ready to start. T minus 115, the liquid hydrogen tank is now at flight pressure. The seating, uh, Team of course, uh, minutes, Air Force Colonel Brewster one. Shaw and Navy Commander Dick Richards are sitting up in the front seats. This uh, Columbia configuration is a two-level configuration. Uh, uh, Air Force Major Mark Brown, uh, one of the space rookies, uh, will sit uh, alone on the lower deck uh, of the split-level cabin and will trade seats with another astronaut uh, for the descent when they come back in about five days. Instrumentation recorders have gone into the record mode. The external tank heaters on the ET to orbiter attach fittings have been turned off. We've now had the handoff to the ground launch sequencer. We have a go for auto sequence start. The ground launch sequencer has handed off to Columbia. The shuttle now controlling. T minus 20 seconds. T minus 15 seconds. The SRB nozzle gimbal profile is now underway. T minus 10. We have go for main engine start. Seven, six, go for main engine start. Four, three, two, one, and lift off. Lift off on Columbia and it's return to flight. This is Mission Control Houston Roll Program initiated. program confirmed for Columbia. Three main engines up and running. Currently throttling down to 97% and uh, throttling down now to 65% on the three main engines for the passage through maximum dynamic pressure.
altitude 18,000 feet, downrange about one nautical mile. Good throttles confirmed by the flight dynamics officer. Columbia has just been given the go at throttle up call by Mission Control. Altitude 62,000 feet. Downrange about seven nautical miles. Three good APUs, three good fuel cells, three good main engines. Current altitude 100,000 feet. Downrange 13 nautical miles. Standing by for SRB separation, and we have SRB separation. Downrange 30 nautical miles now, 187,000 feet. Velocity is 4,300 feet per second. minutes 40 seconds into the flight still have uh, three good main engines running at 104 percent three good fuel cells three good apus our altitude uh, 244,000 feet downrange 51 nautical miles and the two engine towel call has just gone up to columbia Passing through 290,000 feet now, downrange 75 nautical miles. Flight Dynamics Officer reports we're tracking right down the middle of the pike on uh, guidance and uh, energy. 314,000 feet, downrange 90 nautical miles. So Columbia is on its way after a long time sitting in the hangar, nearly three and a half years. They uh, did about 250 safety modifications in the post-Challenger era. They uh, refurbished the entire vehicle. They put uh, new heat tiles, a new lightweight uh, version of the heat tiles underneath it and uh, reinforced uh, some of the areas of the nose gear. They uh, have uh, this time taken uh, some engines from some other vehicles and put it aboard Columbia for the flight. And uh, so the tables have been turned uh, for a change. The mission is a Department of Defense secret mission, the fourth that the uh, NASA has carried so far. Here is some uh, animation of uh, just about what we would be seeing now if uh, we were in front of the vehicle instead of behind it. 7,000 feet, downrange 154 nautical miles. Columbia was NASA's original space shuttle. Uh, it was the one that made the first flight back in 1981. And uh, many in the space agency now say that uh, this uh, launch and mission uh, signifies a return uh, to the space program at uh, full throttle. The mission is a secret, but uh, it's widely reported that they are carrying a spy reconnaissance satellite that will cover most of the globe, uh, especially the Soviet Union and China, and uh, that will uh, help uh, in uh, what has been a long dry period for the intelligence gathering department. Uh, CNN's John Zarella is uh, at the Kennedy Space Center. Uh, John, it looked like uh, a beautiful launch uh, despite some earlier problems with the weather. Boy, it sure did. It was uh, picture perfect once it got out of that... Uh that fog bank and uh, it looked very reminiscent as far as its trajectory of the last uh, Department of Defense uh, secret mission and and uh, the experts uh, are with us at least one of the experts is with us now John Pike a Federation of American Scientists and uh, John you can tell 
by that trajectory, the direction in which the vehicle is going when it makes its turn as to where it's going and what it might be carrying. Right. The shuttle basically flies into two different trajectories. One straight due east uh, when it's trying to maximize the amount of payload it can carry into orbit. Uh, in that case, the shuttle would have been moving off to the right of the launch pad. The other orbit, uh, which reaches as far north as 57 degrees, about as far north as Moscow, is used when they're trying to maximize the uh, area of the Earth's surface that they can cover. The fact that the shuttle was going off to that 57 degree orbit and confirms that it does have one of these uh, imaging intelligence payloads, the KH-12 on it. Again, for those viewers that have just joined us, what has your, your sources, your intelligence, been able to gather as to what's on board Columbia? Well, putting together all the pieces, it looks like Columbia just uh, launched with the first of a new generation of photographic reconnaissance satellites, popularly called the KH-12, that will be used for treaty verification, monitoring military troop movements, and looking at third world crises. How sophisticated a satellite is this, and what exactly can it do? Well, this satellite, uh, which probably weighs about 28,000 pounds, is basically a large telescope uh, with a television camera attached. It can detect objects as small as a few inches across, be able to see in the dark, uh, and would be able to uh, see a license plate, even though it might not be able to read the figures on the license plate. And the speculation is that it is also carrying uh, in its cargo bay a Star Wars experiment. Well, it's reported that there's also a 275-pound uh, small sensor test satellite on there that should be placed into space uh, the day after the main payload's launched that uh, would be used to test uh, Star Wars uh, uh, sensor technology. John Pike, thank you very much. Well, Tom, uh, that's about as uh, accurate as uh, we're going to be able to get as far as uh, what the payload is on board Columbia. It's uh, off and on its way, and uh, I know you'll be following the mission the next several days. How long the mission may be, you'll be there. Tom? All right. It, it is expected that uh, sometime Sunday they will be returning, and we'll have more coverage right after these messages. That's away from Columbia's return and touchdown at runway 17 at Edwards Air Force Base in California. The landing will cap a five-day mission that has been veiled in secrecy. Here's a live picture from Edwards Air Force Base from a helicopter. You see the uh, dry lake bit area where they'll be coming back. Unlike previous missions where as many as a half million people have gathered uh, to watch the shuttle return, the only way they're going to see it this time is if they look up in the sky and uh, possibly see it as it streaks towards the runway. CNN's Greg Lamont is at Edwards Air Force Base and uh, joins us live now. Uh, uh, Greg, it's uh, got to be a little unusual to look around and not uh, see any uh, of the usual people you expect to see uh, on previous shuttle landings that uh, turn out. Well, this is a, a desert area, and it's certainly a kind of a deserted place today. As you said, usually there's about 500,000 people that are spread across the desert floor hoping to catch a glimpse of the shuttle as it prepares to land, but not so today. That's because it was a secret military mission, and so the public has been barred from the landing site, although we've been wondering why because we are certainly being allowed to be here to provide live coverage of the landing. NASA is providing live video of the landing as well. And so we thought to ourselves, well, why not let the public uh, back onto the landing site? We asked, we were told that we couldn't be told because it is a secret. What is no secret is that it will be landing at 9.37 Eastern time here at uh, Edwards Air Force Base. We've been told it's been a near flawless flight. About a half an hour ago, the braking rockets were fired. Uh, putting the orbiter into a descent mode, and it should be landing within the next half hour. We will be here with live coverage beginning at 9.30 Eastern to see the shuttle Columbia uh, land after its five-day mission. Greg Lamont, CNN Live at Edwards Air Force Base. All right, Greg, everyone, of course, will be looking at Columbia now that it rejoins the fleet of three, Discovery and Atlantis, uh, the other pair of orbiters that are in service. Three more flights planned for this year, nine on the schedule for next year. So uh, it was important to NASA to uh, get this mission off on time and on schedule with a return at Edwards Air Force Base in California. Of course, we will have live coverage uh, beginning this morning, the landing, 9.37 Eastern Time, just after dawn out in California. We will be on a few minutes before, so we can show you Columbia touching down. Coming up, right here on CNN. We'll see you at the top. Hello, I'm Tom Intier. The Space Shuttle Columbia is heading towards Edwards Air Force Base in California. 
capping a five-day all-military secret mission to launch a reconnaissance satellite. This is a live picture from Edwards Air Force Base in California. The time you see at the bottom left of your screen is the time remaining until touchdown, a clock going backwards. Uh, what has happened this morning, the deorbit burn occurred about 8.35 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time over the Indian Ocean. That uh, slowed them down and uh, managed to uh, flip the shuttle over and uh, then they were able to uh, streak back towards their, their landing destination of runway 17. Landing time scheduled for 9.37. Uh, Long-range tracking cameras uh, picked up the shuttle first about uh, 250 miles out. Uh, Long-range tracking cameras uh, from uh, Edwards Air Force, or Vandenberg Air Force Base. Uh, uh, the re-entry temperature hits about 2,800 degrees as uh, they re-enter the Earth's atmosphere. The, uh, uh, Tiles get red hot, uh, traveling at 16,500 miles an hour. They are uh, under manual control now. When they, when they go into the uh, landing area, they're hitting 213 to 226 miles an hour. Again, about a minute and 40 seconds until touchdown. Uh, you see uh, Columbia approaching. Uh, they uh, take control of the shuttle at about 49,000 feet uh, and lower the wheels at the uh, last second before they uh, touch down on the runway. Mission length, about five days and one hour. Uh, they will land at uh, exactly 9.37 and 45 seconds. The first flight of Columbia was back on April 12, 1981, but uh, it has been known as the Hangar Queen before this. Uh, they touched down 10 days before a Challenger explosion uh, back in 1986. Here is a live picture. Columbia nose down, making their approach into runway 17. Normally there are about a half million people that uh, gather out in California even when it occurs uh, as early in the morning as this one is uh, happening uh, to watch the uh, shuttle return. Uh, if they are gathered, they're gathered outside the gates of Edwards. They uh, locked the gates and didn't allow the people in this time. Gears down and locked on Columbia. Main gear touchdown. And nose gear touchdown for Columbia as she rolls out on runway 17 left at Edwards Air Force Base. So the Space Shuttle Columbia has returned after five days in orbit after a three and a half year time in the hangar she was known as the Hangar Queen no longer. She is now a member of the orbital shuttle team, once again joining Atlantis and Discovery as the three orbiters that NASA has on the shelf. CNN's Greg Lamont joins us now from Edwards Air Force Base in California as Columbia has rolled to a stop. Uh, Greg, uh, this is probably not as exciting as some of the previous ones you've done out there. Uh, to say the least. Despite the fact this was the first flight of Columbia in three and a half years and that 258 modifications were necessary to get it flight ready, and the fact that it uh, successfully deployed a satellite, and that it means with the successful landing that we just saw a moment ago, that Discovery, Atlantis, and Columbia are all now flight ready, and NASA says that it can now put Challenger disaster behind it. There's really no fanfare out here today, no flag waving, no uh, cheering crowds because the public was barred from the landing site. Never, neither, needless to say, though, the media was allowed here, and uh, we were able to provide you live pictures of the landing. And at least America can now rest assured that its five astronauts who've been in space for five days are home safely. Greg Lamont, CNN Live, Edwards Air Force Base. All right, Greg, we probably won't see the astronauts for a little while. But it'll take some time before they get out of Columbia. But Columbia is back safely after a secret mission to launch a satellite that will view the Soviet Union, a mission that has lasted five days and has been cloaked in secrecy. But Columbia is now back. And now we go back to your money. Put our flag on the moon sea of tranquility. Now you can own this $5 commemorative coin marking this historic event. 
about the same diameter as a silver dollar and painstakingly minted in a brilliant uncirculated finish, this legal tender coin is being issued by the Republic of the Marshall Islands, where America has an important tracking station, issued on the anniversary date, July 20th, and minted only in 1989, this historic coin is available at its $5 face value for a limited time. CNN's Greg Lamont reports on Columbia's classified trip into space. With a beautiful backdrop of crystal clear blue skies, the shuttle Columbia safely returned to Earth following its five-day secret military mission to deploy a spy satellite. And it was a flawless landing. Main gear touchdown. And nose gear touchdown for Columbia as she rolls out on runway 17 left at Edwards Air Force Base. Unfortunately, only NASA personnel and the news media were allowed to see the landing in person. Because the mission was classified, the public, which normally totals as much as 500,000 for shuttle landings, wasn't invited. So instead of feeling the emotion of a half million flag-waving, cheering spectators, the crew had to settle for a traditional handshake from NASA Administrator Richard Truly. This was the first flight in three and a half years for the oldest ship in the shuttle fleet, and following 258 modifications to get the craft flight ready, the initial inspection of the orbiter's heat tiles indicated Columbia appeared to have fared quite well, especially considering at one time it had been gutted for spare parts. It was really an honor for us and a pleasure to be able to um, be involved with the return to flight of Columbia and the restoration of NASA's three space shuttle fleet, which will soon be uh, four. And uh, we're always proud to uh, operate for the Department of the Defense because we all work for that outfit. My uh, only regret is we don't have the pictures and movies and experiences we can relate to you today, but hopefully sometime we can because we had a wonderful time. We did a lot of good for the United States and we're looking forward to doing it again. While very little is known about Columbia's mission, it has been confirmed a military reconnaissance satellite was deployed, apparently to spy on military targets over the Soviet Union in an effort to better verify Soviet compliance with arms agreements. But equally important was getting Columbia safely back in space. NASA says, now that the orbiter, along with its sister ships Atlantis and Discovery, are available for flight duty, it can finally put the effects of the Challenger disaster behind it and get on with the remaining three scheduled flights this year and nine the next. Greg Lamott, CNN, Edwards Air Force Base, California.